<laughs> Thank you. you. Made me Thank sound you. better well, than I am. Well, you've had a long you career. You made me sound better than I That's am. That's not true. No, it's very nice. Your character in this film, Mike Wazowski, wants to be a big league monster, but he just isn't scary, according to Dean Hardscrabble, played by Helen Mirren. I, I, Billy, I've heard the story actually parallels some of your early ambitions, trying to become a major league baseball player. Well, yeah, you know, just um, when you stop growing in third grade, then um, <laughs> it's like, whoop. And actually... Uh, Meaning you were physically small. Yeah, but that really started um, seriously two months before my bar mitzvah. <laughs> I'm the youngest of three brothers. So my older brother Joel six two. My middle brother Rip is like just about six, and I was a um, you know I was a lab mouse. I mean I was the la I was the last guy, and I, my mother was worried that I wasn't something was wrong. Uh, you know, and I was very content that, you know, waiting for my spurt, which I still am. So we, she takes me to the doctor, and they x-ray my growth plates in my hands, which is what they used to do then, you know, see where the spaces are, how, you know. And we're waiting, and I, I felt like my my whole future was right on the line as um, the doctor comes back in, sits down, and says the words that to this day haunt me. Maybe five eight, <laughs> and that was like. Oh. But you still got a baseball scholarship. Yeah, I was right? still. I'm still. You know, and I actually played two weeks ago at Dodger Stadium. It, with the, I played with the 1978 Yankees, the old timers game. They asked me to 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 not only manage the Yankees but also play, and I played shortstop with um, all the great old Yankees from 1978. So I love to play, but it was definitely uh, like Mike hearing news that you don't want to hear, but then how do you overcome it, which in the movie becomes a great victory for him. And is that normal for you to be drawing on... Nothing is a, normal for me. Is, is that a tradition for you, to be drawing on personal experience when you're doing an animated film as a voiceover? Uh, um, yeah, you know, because it's all the same. You're, all, you're, all, you're creating, a, in this case, a monster, but a human being. You know, we gave him heartbeats. Um, we gave him, you know, blood in his veins. I just get a model when the first, the first movie, just a, like a plastic model of, of this... Mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of room to work with, a big eye, <laughs> um, uh, no neck, uh, hands and legs, and a mouth. And so how do you make him who mm. he is? And then we tried different looks, um, sounds, actually, for his mouth, and we screen tested them. Uh, John Lasseter took the Mike Wazowski prototype and took lines from movies that I was in and put them in his mouth. Wow. So there was little Mike screaming and yelling from Harry and Sally about the stupid wagon wheel coffee table. But it was little Mike saying it, and that didn't sound right. And then they took lines from City Slickers, and that didn't sound right. And then I actually went back to a character I had created on SNL with Chris Guest, which was the masochist, Willie and Frankie. <laughs> I hate when that happens. And that and that basically became the voice of Mike Wazowski. There's got to be something, um, I don't want to say cathartic, maybe energizing about getting to play a kid, too. Uh, I mean, you, 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 once somebody becomes an adult on screen, you can't necessarily play a kid. But with your voice, you've got a young voice still. Doesn't yeah. matter how old you get, you still got the young voice. Yeah, and and they made him look a little younger. I mean, he's a little. It's weird, but he's a little trimmer. <laughs> um, oh, if only life could be like that. And he's got a retainer, and um, so he had that little thing with his teeth. But he also had a, a sparkle in his eye. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, about the future, about where he was in his life, and that's what I found incredibly poignant about this movie as well as how funny it is was how touching it is that, that these two guys are now 17 or 18 years old mm. and 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 to play that part of someone's life um, was really fun for John and I John Goodman and I and I totally associate with Mike he's the favorite character I've ever played of anybody I've ever done I love playing this guy and I, and because I think he's He's fearless, and he loves to be a leader, and he doesn't let anything get in his way. And if it does, he'll ruminate about it and then triumph over it if he can. And he believes in himself, and he, and he finds new paths. And I've always had to do that uh, in life and in my career. So I, I totally love playing Little Mike. Let me ask you about doing that in your life and your career. Take me back a bit, and we'll come back to the movie. Uh, if we go back to the very beginning, your father founded... Commodore Records in New York grew, and you, you grew well, actually my uncle founded the, the, the okay. company, but Dad ran Dad it. Dad ran it, and, yeah. and it's, it was a label too. You were surrounded by some of the great, some the of the jazz greatest greats, jazz right? players of all. Louis time. Armstrong, Billy Holiday was show Coleman business. Hawkins, Sidney Bechet, yeah. show business was then always in the cards for you. Uh, I, you know, I, I'll tell you something, um, and you are my first Gian. Um, <laughs> that I'm glad uh, to be your first Gian. I, 
um, I never thought there would be anything else except maybe baseball um, for me. I always was most comfortable being in front of people, performing. I was five or six years old in like elementary school But plays. you didn't think it would be a career necessarily. Uh, I didn't know what else I was going to do. I always sort of thought I'd be doing something like this. I taught school for a while. I was, I was a substitute teacher, but at, the, at night I'd be going to the comedy clubs and so on. But comedy instead of music. Yeah. Even yeah. though the lineage was music. The lineage was definitely music, but I have to say my dad was a comedy maven. We had this little record store in addition to the, the label uh, on 42nd Street in New York City on uh, between Lexington and 3rd. It was called the Commodore Music Shop. It was the hangout for jazz in the city. But it meant that Dad always brought home the comedy albums because mm. w- the records were phenomenal records. Um, and also, it was really the golden age of, of comedy on television. There were um, auteurs, um, uh, to use a Latin word, on TV like <laughs> Ernie Kovacs, like Jack Benny, Burns and Allen, Bilko, Steve Allen Show, and then Jack Parr. I was he and Dad would let me stay up uh, late on school nights mm. when Jonathan Winters would be on the Jack Parr Show because he was so exciting to me. And then came home the albums. It would be Nichols and May Live on Broadway, uh, Jonathan Winters albums, and then came the Daddy of Them All, the two thousand year old man, mm. and then Bill Cosby records. He was here not too long ago. Mel was here. Uh, Stan, I, well, he wasn't here. We did a full. He was in L.A., but we did a whole. Uh, yeah, we just did his tribute, the yeah, AFI yeah, tribute. That and, was, and, yeah. and that was um, that was became my Bible. And when did you know you were funny? Oh, real early. Really? Yeah. As a kid, you just a ham. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big time. Which in a Jewish household is uh, an anomaly. <laughs> right, but I would right, stand right. on a coffee table and uh, imitate relatives. I still do that, and um, and uh, and I still get paid. Back then, my cousin Edith, who's a hundred and four years old, um, would give me dimes, and I put dimes on my forehead at the end of the show. So when my head was filled up with coins, the show was over. And I'd, we'd run back to know, how much did you make? And I'd s- sweep off my forehead and go, was 90 cents. <laughs> you know, it was enough to buy something good then. And then uh, Billy famously, I mean, it, it's hard to sort of determine where the first big break is, but it, it was supposed to be. You were supposed to appear on the first ever episode of SNL yes. in 75. October 11th. It falls through. Yes. What happens? Um, you know, it's always a... Uh, from my side, I'll just simply say I was bumped. Um uh, by Lorne Michaels, um, because my piece ran too long. Uh, there was a run through the night before. I was part of this whole, uh, the beginnings of the show, and I was to do stand up on the first show with Andy Kaufman. I uh, was the other uh, comedy guest and a, 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 a Canadian co- a comedian named Valerie Bromfield. We were the three discoveries, hmm. and um, and what we discovered was my piece was was cut. And I went home that night, and um, I came back a year later uh, when Ron Nesson, who was uh, Gerald Ford's press secretary, hosted the show, sort of an esoteric choice. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and then, but, you know, so that was a, that was a Mike Wazowski moment. Because mm. I thought... So why didn't you just cut, cut the sketch down in time? I, I didn't have any... I, the thing took six minutes long, and it was six minutes long. And in the Friday night rehearsal in front of a live audience, it, re, it just did great. Lauren said, I need two minutes. I said, two minutes out? And he goes, no, two minutes total. <laughs> I couldn't do that particular. It was a physical piece that needed the amount mm. of time it needed. I didn't have anything else. I was a new comedian. I didn't have that little two-minute hunk like Andy had Mighty right, Mouse, right. which he did on that show. I just didn't have anything else. And so I, that's, that's what it was. must have been a tough moment. It was really hard because I knew that show was going to be important Besides being really fun. Well, speaking of important, it, you do rebound. And in 77, you land your first big role playing Jody Dallas, one of the first openly gay characters on network TV and on, on an edgy sitcom. So it was certainly a groundbreaking role, Billy. Did you know that at the time? Did yeah. you recognize how Oh, important? sure. And it was part of the risk of doing it and part of the decision-making. You know, the world then, and I have to say the United States then, was very different in 1977 than it is now, um, especially towards their attitudes um, towards a gay character on a television series. Um, you know, I, Rob Reiner was my closest friend, and I'd walk down the street with him, and they'd yell, Meathead. Hmm. You know, I didn't want to be the, you know, hey, fairy, you know, because that's what you, 
ended up happening a lot. So I, I, the scrutiny of that was very strong. But when I sat down with Susan Harris, who was the creator of the show, a genius writer, wrote the first first 68 episodes all by herself. Hmm. Uh, and I sat down with her and Paul Witt and Tony Thomas and a director, Jay Sandridge, who was off Mary Tyler Moore's show, genius guy. And they laid out the Bible of what we were going to try and do with Jody Dallas. And then I thought, well, this could be something that not only could be funny, uh, and, but it could be important to people. And that's why I decided to do you it. You kind of took it from both sides, conservative groups and, and even the National Gay Task Force who believed Jody advanced gay stereotypes. Did Was there any point where... You were concerned about this affecting the rest of your career? Yeah, sure. I, I, I you know, I was concerned because of. Um, listen, Carol O'Connor may have been one of the greatest characters of all time, but when he walked down the street, people called him Archie. Right. Couldn't so, get another gig. So you know, um, but that was a pretty great one for a yeah, while. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was then it was hard to believe him in something else. But I knew that as a stand-up, I could go out as myself. On various shows and 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 be myself. You go, but on it was to, it was it was really nerve wracking. You go on to SNL and, and lots of other things throughout the eighties, and, and then that there's unquestionably the, the huge hit. Yeah, you play Harry Burns in the romantic comedy When Harry Met Sally in nineteen eighty nine. Billy, this is considered a classic, and and it was nominated for many Glo- Golden Globes that year, but only one Oscar. Nora right. Ephron for screenplay, even as a longtime Oscar host, does it bother you when a great comedy doesn't get the recognition it deserves? Oh, absolutely. Because it, it's, you know, the it's a really good movie, and there has been a lot of comedies that people tend to disregard um, as important, but um, you know the. The victory of that movie was the movie itself and the love affair that it still has with new generations of, of mm. people so many years later. They look at that as their Casablanca. You know, it's their love story. But, you know, I think that the Academy should have uh, a category for, for comedies. I, it's just, you know, it just it just should be. I mean, it's very difficult to make a good comedy. It just it just is. I asked Mel Brooks the same question. I mean, it's not it's 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 not taken seriously enough. Yeah. Know, comedians aren't still. Yeah. I mean there's still. been some performances. I mean Eddie Murphy and um uh the in the first um Nutty Professor and the second one is phenomenal. He plays all of these characters. The whole family. I mean I that's one of the great performances I've ever seen on screen. Really it's fun amazing work that he does. They're also different men and women and you know and then Steve Martin and all of me. Um, you know, you can go on and on and find really terrific performances uh, all the way down the line. And I got, I was hosting that year that we were nominated. And the night before the nominations uh, were coming out, and I was already nervous about doing the show, mm. uh, there was a announcer in, in, in L.A., a movie critic on TV named uh, David Sheehan, and he was very good. And he went, so here's my predictions. And he went through the best actors. I don't remember who they were. And the fifth one, those are those four are shoe-ins. And the fifth one could come from uh, Ken Branagh for Henry V, <laughs> but my personal favorite, I'd love to see Billy Crystal nominated for when Harry was, and, and that could possibly happen. I'm watching this going, what? I never th- had an inkling yeah. about that. And I didn't even think about that. Now I'm, you know... A trout in a stream, and the lure hit, and so I, I bite onto it hard. And then I knew that they announced at five o'clock in the morning, uh, so the Today Show can break it. And um, the phone didn't ring, so I knew it wasn't. But for that split second, it got terribly interesting. But back to the Billy Crystal as Mike Wazowski, the little guy who uh, uh, wonders if he's and who's physically smaller. And and I wonder about points in your career. I mean, anyone would look at your career and go, go the guy must feel like gold because he's had such successes. But I wonder about moments where you felt really validated. And there's a great story. Um, uh, when you're hosting, you've won multiple Emmy Awards for hosting the Oscars. Uh, the the morning after the 1998 Oscars, you know where I'm going with this. Mm-hmm. You get these two phone calls. Yeah, tell us about that. Well, I've been up all night. Uh, just you, you're filled. You don't even have blood. You just have some sort of strange adrenaline. Of boy, that felt good. How did it go? Was that was that that was funny? That was I shouldn't have said. Oh, that was great. I love. But they didn't. Know. And so you, and it's like the morning after the prom. You're just you're just wired, and you know, hope you scored. 
And <laughs> the phone rings, and I had an unflappable assistant uh, who had been around show business forever. She was, uh, sh she was great. And um, she said, uh, Mickey Rooney is on the phone. Hmm. So, Mickey Rooney? For, okay. And then Mickey Rooney gets on the phone. Mickey Rooney is now 94 or 5. Hmm. Um, he was, just to refresh people's memory, and, and, and new listeners should go look at Andy Hardy movies and go watch what this giant of a little guy was. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a big Mike Wazowski, uh, Mickey Rooney. He was the number one box office star, I think, seven years in a row. Wow. Um, and, and he could sing, he could dance, he could do everything. Judy Garland yeah, movies, phenomenal. Yeah. But then came the call of calls, which was she called back and said, Johnny Carson is on the phone. <laughs> I said, is it him? Yes, he called himself. I said, all right. She's unnecessarily whispering. Yeah. I, <laughs> that's how important it is. Yeah. So I said, well, you know what? Tell him to F off. <laughs> she went, what? I said, no, put him on. You know, and I'm sweating like Albert Brooks in broadcast news. I mean, I'm, you know, it's right. like God's calling. Uh, hey, Billy, Johnny. Just want to tell you, watching the show last night, God, you were great. And uh, and my wife, Alex, says, well, you call him yourself, so here I am. And I, it was like getting that message from, you know. Ordained. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, um, great, said some lovely things. Um, I said, Johnny, I can't tell you how much this means to me. He said, you just did. Mm -hmm. And um, let's stay in touch. And, and, and it was so, I mean, you know, Johnny was a great host of The Tonight Show. Um, and he was a great Oscar host, and here he was calling me to say really lovely things, and it was really pretty special. It's interesting when I think about you, man, because it, it, you you last hosted the Oscars, of course, famously last year, 20, 20, 20, 2012. Uh, uh, and some people wanted you back this year after the, uh, uh, this year's Oscars, but but uh, partly you hosted because you are so consistently funny to a large and broad audience to a certain extent. You were the safer choice after the you know they had the Anne Hathaway and the Franco and 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 it's like let's go back to some people said the mainstream choice Billy Crystal and I think about you, a guy who, at least earlier in your career but for much of your career was at the cutting edge of comedy, being considered the mainstream guy. Yeah. How does that feel to you? Um, it's all right. I I don't I don't understand what that really is except that means you, people everyone can like you. And I thought what we did when we hosted the show wasn't mainstream, mm -hmm. what we did. Um, you know, no host did the things that we did on the show when we when we were doing it. The medleys, the, the opening films, um, those were all sort of cutting edge to me. So I didn't understand what the mainstream thing is. And they made it sound like it was something bad. You know, so that, that bugged me. A Middle of bit. the road. Yeah, but... Um, you don't self-identify that way. That's all right. Johnny Carson was right down the middle. <laughs> that word, Johnny said one thing very important. He said, "There's New York and L.A., but you know where it counts? The middle of the country." You, even as one of the most celebrated comedians, you said, "I'm not concerned with getting laughs. If I can move the audience, that's what's important to me." Why is poignancy equally, if not more, important than getting laughs? Because you? it's such a it's such a a deep emotion. The laugh is a you know, I love getting them. Obviously, that's the the gold you 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 know you pan for all the time. But I sort of know that that's probably going to be there. But if I can, what if I'm moving you? Then I'm touching you in a different way, and it, it means you're feeling something. A laugh is a spontaneous, weird kind of thing that happens to our bodies. It's a, this a, this. If you think about it, you're hearing or seeing something that makes you look silly for a second and makes you make a sound like <laughs> however people laugh that's a, it's a chemical strange thing akin to a sneeze of some, i don't know it's just a great thing that we do but if you can if i'm making you think and i'm making you have an honest emotion then that's harder to do in in, in some ways and and if you do them both at the same time you really got some magic good. and that's what i've you know, I felt about doing 700 Sundays on Broadway, mm. which I'm going back to do because um, I missed it and I loved doing it. And there's nothing satisfying, more satisfying, than hearing theaters hold about 1,500, 1,600 people laugh. But, Gian, the best thing is the silence. When I'm on stage and I'm talking about 
real hard times in my life you and you can't hit a pin drop wow is that a powerful feeling mm. and that's what i feel about you know having seen the movie just the other night with the with the premiere audience Monsters my you Monsters you was really funny it's it's amazingly well made but there's a couple of moments when these two guys who when you watch the movie and i say two guys it's not even monsters they're two friends who find each other and there's a very poignant hmm. scene um, by a lake late at night and now they're in the real world they're not in the, the safety yeah. of the monster world and Mike realizes who he's not going to be and his friend tells him who he can be and who he is to him because they're pals audience was losing it yeah. and it was fantastic that's and that's a, why the Pixar movies are so good because they don't take their audiences for granted they don't just throw it up there and think oh we'll do something silly and I love it they, they always take the heart away and that is to make you feel something. Well, before I let you go, you have four grandchildren? Yes, I do. Who will no doubt eventually see Monsters U? They saw, it. Well, they, they saw it already. Well, the two and a half of them saw it. Well, <laughs> Little guy's three months <laughs> old, and the three and a half year old got to the got to the uh, short subject before and said, this is frightening me, and left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Sully might freak him out. Whether it's this film or, or your previous rules, what, what do you, and you look at your grandchildren, what, what, what do you want your comedic legacy to be? That grandpa loved what he did. You know, and then, and then, and that um, you know, he made me laugh. My and he was the sort of the same guy he was when he'd be in the room with us. You know, mm -hmm. when when I, the grandpa got me. You know, it's all going to sound like a Hallmark Hall of Fame card, but maybe this is middle of the road. But I'd rather be in the middle of the road than on the curb. Um, said you know he he I he always made me giggle. So that's a great thing. It's really nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Say hi to your dad. I will. I will. Tell him, what you, tell him what he said to you. <laughs> tell, him, tell him the story. <laughs> Listen, my audience already knows <laughs> how my dad know. feels about me, and, okay. and, and that he'll be thrilled to hear from you more, more than right. he is from me.